Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Bodicher. I am the Director of Media Relations here at the Bank of Canada, and I'll be moderating this press conference about today's interest rate announcement and monetary policy report. Comme d'habitude, le gouverneur Macklem va prononcer une déclaration préliminaire et après ça, on va tourner aux questions. After his opening statement, Governor Macklem and Senior Deputy Governor Carolyn Rogers will be happy to take your questions. And so, I will turn it over to Governor Macklem for his opening remarks. La parole est à vous. Thank you, Paul. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here with the Senior Deputy Governor, Carolyn Rogers, to discuss our monetary policy decision and the monetary policy report. Today we maintained our policy interest rate at 5% and we're also continuing our policy of quantitative easing, sorry, quantitative tightening. <laughs> Three main messages this morning. First, monetary policy is working. Total CPI and core inflation have eased further in recent months and we expect inflation to continue to move closer to our 2% target this year. Second, growth in the economy looks to be picking up. We expect GDP growth to be solid this year and to strengthen further in 2025. And third, as we consider how much longer to hold the policy rate at the current level, we're looking for evidence that the recent further easing in underlying inflation will be sustained. On a trois grands messages ce matin. Premièrement, la politique monétaire fonctionne. L'inflation mesurée par l'EPC global et l'inflation fondamentale ont encore diminué ces derniers mois. L'inflation devrait continuer de se rapprocher à la cible de 2 cette année. Deuxièmement, la croissance de l'économie semble se redresser. On prévoit une croissance solide de PIB cette année et on pense qu'elle va continuer à se renforcer en 2025. Et troisièmement, pour décider combien de temps encore laisser le taux directeur au niveau actuel, on cherche des signes que la récente diminution de l'inflation sous-jacente va durer. So before taking your questions, let me take a moment to discuss how the economy is evolving. We've revised up our outlook for global growth. U.S. economic growth again exceeded our expectations, and while growth is expected to slow later this year, economic activity is stronger than previously forecast. In Canada, growth stalled in the second half of last year, and the economy moved into excess supply. The labor market also cooled from very overheated levels. With employment growing more slowly than the working age population, the unemployment rate has risen gradually over the last year to 6.1% in March. There are some signs that wage pressures are beginning to ease. Economic growth is forecast to strengthen in 2024. Strong population growth is increasing consumer demand as well as the supply of workers and spending by households is forecast to recover through the year. Spending by governments also contributes to growth, and U.S. strength supports Canadian exports. Overall, we forecast GDP growth in Canada of 1.5% this year and about 2% in 2025 and 2026. The strengthening economy will gradually absorb excess supply through 2025 and into 2026. CPI inflation eased to 2.8% in February, and price increases are now slowing across most major categories. Inflation rates for durable goods, clothing, food, and services, such as recreation and travel, have all declined. However, shelter cost inflation is still high and remains the biggest contributor to overall inflation. Some other services, like restaurant meals, also remain persistently high. Looking ahead, we expect core inflation to continue to ease gradually. The more timely three-month rates of core inflation fell below 3% in February, suggesting some downward momentum. But with gasoline prices rising, CPI inflation is likely to remain around 3% in coming months. It's then expected to ease below 2.5% in the second half of this year and reach the 2% target in 2025. 
As always, there are risks around our forecast. Inflation could be higher if global tensions escalate and this boosts energy prices and further disrupts international shipping. House prices in Canada could rise faster than expected. And wage growth could remain high relative to productivity. On the downside, economic activity globally and in Canada could be weaker than expected, cooling demand and inflation too much. We don't want to leave monetary policy this restrictive for longer than we need to. But if we lower our policy rate too early or cut too fast, we could jeopardize the progress we've made bringing inflation down. So based on our forecast and these risks, Governing Council decided it was appropriate to maintain the policy rate at 5%. Dans l'ensemble, les données depuis janvier ont renforcé notre conviction que l'inflation va continuer de baisser graduellement, même si la croissance se raffermit. Nos principales principaux indicateurs de l'inflation pointent maintenant tous dans la bonne direction. Et les données récentes indiquent un redressement de la croissance. La plupart des gens veulent surtout savoir quand on va diminuer notre taux directeur. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut pour nous convaincre de réduire le taux? Pour résumer, les données correspondent à ce qu'on veut voir. Mais on veut voir le mouvement se, peut fruiver, se poursuivre pour être certain que les progrès vers la stabilité prix vont durer. La nouvelle baisse de l'inflation fondamentale est très récente. On veut être sûr que ce n'est pas juste temporaire. The Governing Council also concluded that overall the data since January have increased our confidence that inflation will continue to come down gradually even as economic activity strengthens. Our key indicators of inflation have all moved in the right direction, and recent data point to a pickup in economic growth. Now, I realize that what most Canadians want to know is when are we going to lower our policy rate? What do we need to see to be convinced to cut? The short answer is we are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that the progress towards price stability will be sustained. The further decline we've seen in inflation is very recent. We need to be assured it's not just a temporary dip. In the months ahead, we will be closely watching the evolution of core inflation. And we will remain focused on the balance between demand and supply in the economy, inflation expectations, wage growth, and corporate pricing behavior as indicators of where inflation is headed. To conclude, We've come a long way in the fight against inflation, and recent progress is encouraging. We want to see this progress sustained. And with that summary, the Senior Deputy Governor and I will be very pleased to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Governor. Let me just uh, quickly go over the ground rules. Um, as usual, we'll start with the reporters uh, we have here in Ottawa at the bank. Um, I'll ask you to everybody to please limit yourself to one question to maximize our chances of getting to every media outlet. After we go through the room, I will then uh, turn to the phones. If I forget to do so, please state your name and affiliation. Avant de poser une question, vous identifier si je l'ai pas fait. Et comme toujours, libre à vous de poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. So let's get started here in Ottawa, and our first question is going to go to uh, Najud Almaliz of the Canadian Press. Morning. Uh, is the door open to a rate cut in June? Is that in the, within the realm of possibilities for you? Um, yes, it's within the realm of possibilities. Um, look, I, I think we've been pretty clear. We, ha we are encouraged by what we've seen since January. If you look at our indicators, they're not all progressing at the same speed, but they, they're all, they've all been moving in the right direction. Uh, inflation's come down, uh, core inflation's come down. The more timely three-month measures of core inflation suggests there's down momentum. Yes, shelter price inflation is still high. There are certainly some things that are still supporting inflation, but things are moving in the right direction. Uh, we're encouraged by that progress. Um, we need to we need to see that progress continue, uh, and you know, 
if things evolve broadly in line with the outlook that we published today, we will be becoming more confident that we're clearly on a path to 2% inflation and it will be appropriate to cut our interest rate. Okay, next we'll turn to uh, Pramit Mukherjee from uh, Thomson Reuters. Thank you. Uh, just to continue on Najud's question, I mean, between now and uh, June, you will have two sets of data on uh, the labor market, on CPI and uh, on GDP. Do you think those data will, be, and if it continues in the same direction, do you think that data will be sufficient, will give you sufficient evidence and confidence to actually go ahead for a rate cut in June? Um, okay, well, let me expand. Let, let me take you through a bit more systematically um, what we've seen since January and what we're looking for in the next several months. So, as I mentioned, if you look across our key indicators of inflation, we have seen progress uh, across those indicators. Some have made more progress than others, but they're all moving in the right direction. So let's just walk through them. The economy in the second half of last year, growth was close to zero. Economy, uh, that allowed supply to catch up with demand. In fact, it's more than caught up the economies in excess supply. If you look at businesses' short-term expectations of inflation expectations, they've come down. They're running around 3%. If you look at corporate pricing behavior, it's continuing to normalize. There's a pretty detailed box three that looks at this at a very micro data. Uh, we also ask companies what they're planning to do, and you know, fewer companies are planning unusually large or frequent price increases. Um, if you look at households, their perceptions of inflation are coming down. You know, their short-term expectations of inflation have been pretty slow to come down. Um, but it, they are moving in the right direction. Uh, in the labor market, you know, it was very overheated. It has cooled. We're starting to see some evidence that wage growth is uh, easing. If you look at inflation itself, in the last couple of months, it's come down. Core inflation has was running around three and a half. It's now just over three. Again, if you look at the more timely three-month measures of core, um, they're now running below the 12-month measures, suggesting there is some downward momentum. If you look at the, you know, our diffusion indexes, if you look at the how broad-based inflation is, it, it's less widespread. So those things are all moving in the right direction. We're encouraged by this progress, and we want to see that sustained. What is on our mind is that the, decli the, the decline we've seen in momentum is very recent. Wage growth has only uh, just started easing. Uh, inflation expectations uh, for households are only coming down very slowly. So, you know, to summarize, I went through the broad range of indicators to really highlight these are the range of things we're looking at. It's not one data point. It's not one number. It's, you know, all this evidence come the, the coming together. And the message is, look, we are seeing what we, what we hoped uh, and we need to see. Um, we just need to see it for longer to be confident that we are clearly on a path to 2% inflation. And when we are when we are at that point, it will be appropriate to reduce our interest rate. Okay, I'm going to go to Jordan Gowling from CTV next, please. Hi, uh, I just want to ask you a bit about the rebound in business investment in Canada in 2024. Uh, what's accounting for that? Do you just see that as a blip, or you know, a beginning of a sustained path of investment and uh, more confidence in the Canadian economy? Uh, Business investment through the second half of last year was was really quite weak. Um, we, you know, if you look at, for example, Statistics Canada's survey of what companies are planning in terms of their capex, uh, they are certainly planning more. We do think that's going to take a bit of time to materialize. So. Um, through the first half of the year. We don't think it'll be that strong, but we do think uh, it will be picking up. Overall, uh, in, you know, if you look at our growth profile for this year, um, you know, if you look at quarter by quarter GDP growth, roughly about 2% in each quarter, that gives you an annual average of 1.5. If you look at it on a per capita basis, what you see is it starts pretty weak, and as you get further into the year, um, on a per capita basis, it's picking up. So what, what that means is that 
um, you know, per household, households start to spend more over the course of the year. Uh, companies invest when they're more confident that you know, that investment is going to yield a good return on them. So they're, they, they want to be assured the demand is there. So over the course of the year, we think that will start to become more apparent. All right, let's go to Mark Rendell of the Globe and Mail, please. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the growth forecast for both Q1 of this year and for the full year have been upgraded significantly. It seems like a lot of that is being driven by population growth, but I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on what's driving that growth upgrade, how much of it is that population growth picture versus other factors, and if you can kind of unpack a little bit, a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, you're right, Mark, that the, the main factor is population growth, particularly in the first half of the year. Uh, we have revised up our, our estimate of population growth uh, in the first half of the year. Um, as you get later in the year and into 2025, we've actually revised it down because the government has um, uh, announced caps on uh, temporary foreign workers or non-permanent residents, sorry, um, which will pull it down. Um, but in the near term, it is higher, and so you got you got more households, more consumers. Uh, that adds to that adds to demand. That adds to growth. Um, there are some in the very near term. There are some special factors that are are boosting growth in the first quarter of this year. There was a public sector strike in Quebec uh, at the end of last year. That ended. That will provide kind of a a mechanical boost to growth in Q1. There were also a number of other events in the second half of last year, things like the forest fires we all remember. Um, so, you know, just the unwinding of those will boost the first quarter. But you're right, the, the main thing is um, working age population is growing faster, there's more consumers, there's more workers. As you get to the second half of the year, population growth starts to slow, but uh, consumption per household starts to pick up. Uh, so that when you look at growth on a quarterly basis through the year, we do expect some choppiness in the quarter over the, you know, the quarters, but if you average them, they average about 2% a quarter. Thank you for that. Let's go to uh, Greg Quinn from Market News, please. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering about the slight increase to the estimate of the neutral interest rate. Um, is that any kind of barrier to how far, or how fast you can cut interest rates? In other words, is it any kind of a hard floor or a squishy placemat? <laughs> um, Greg, what, what I would emphasize is that, first of all, the neutral rate is not something we can observe directly, and there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. We do estimate it, and it's a necessary input in our models, but it's not something that really has a much of influence on to real-time monetary policy. I mean, in real time, we're much more focused on where's inflation headed, uh, you know, what do we need to do to get inflation back to the 2% target? What do we need to do to maintain it? I mean, the neutral rate is, you know, it, it's a theoretical concept. It's, it's, you want to think about it. The neutral rate is where our policy rate would be in the long run when inflation's at target, the output gap is closed and there are no shocks. Well, of course, we'll never, we'll never actually get there. there. You know, in your forecast in the future, there's no shocks because you can't forecast shocks. But of course, when we get to the future, there will be shocks. So yes, it's something we need in our models and you know, in, in, being, in being fully transparent, we, we, we publish the core assumptions underlying our models. That's one of them. We revise it once a year. And, you know, with with our estimate of U.S. Uh, neutral rate going up, um, uh, and with you know some other factors, uh, we have revised up our neutral rate by 25 basis points. It's a range; the range moved up 25 basis points. Is that having a very big impact on on you know our deliberations in real time? No. Okay, let's go to Mackenzie Gray from Global News next, please. 
Uh, hi there. Uh, in the NPR, the main upside risk sections uh, for uh, inflation, the number one thing, or at least the first bullet point, was uh, house prices could rise sharply. Can you just kind of take us through the assumption on that? And when it comes to deliberations on potential increased uh, interest rate moves, how much consideration is put into what will happen within the housing market? Uh, well, as you as you point out, we list it as one of the risks. Um, certainly, you know, we do expect some pickup in house prices. As long as the, uh, the demand for housing outstrips supply, there will always be the potential for upward pressure on, on housing prices. So we have forecast some increase. Um, what, we, what we outline in the risk section is that increase could be more than we anticipate. And if that were to happen, um, that could put sort of pressure on overall inflation. Um, but what I would stress is, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we take into account when we make a policy decision. It doesn't rest on any, our, our decisions don't rest on any one indicator. As the governor's outline, we think about a lot of things. Um, and we outline more than one risk. So uh, it's there. It's, it's one of the risks. It's not the only one. Okay, next I'm going to go to uh, Kevin Carmichael from The Logic, please. This report and much else that we're seeing. I think you need to put your mic on, Kevin. It is on. Do you not hear me? Oh. You Project. Do you want me to <laughs> project? <laughs> Get on my, stand on my chair, too. Um, question about U.S. productivity, the U.S. productivity boom. Those numbers um, sort of loom over this report. They loom over much of what we're seeing in the global economy right now. What's your read on how real that uh, that boom is. There seems to be debate, debate out there whether this is um, something that's going to be sustained or a passing phase. What's your take? Uh, look, it's a very tough question. Um, just to link it into our own monetary policy report first. Uh, we did revise up our estimate of U.S. potential. Most of that actually is higher population growth. Um, there is some of it is productivity growth, but we have not taken on board a big permanent shift in to higher productivity growth. Um, to be honest, I think in all our countries, uh, the, the gyrations we've seen in the economy through COVID have made, have created big swings in productivity growth. When you, when you shut down your uh, service sector, that's lower productivity than manufacturing. Mechanically, productivity goes up. I mean, what where the U.S. stands out is in, in Canada, like in most countries, uh, productivity growth coming out of the pandemic has been disappointing. We, we thought we would see more pickup as, as supply chains got back to normal, as you know, companies brought on board employees and got new employees and got them trained up. Um, so far, we, we really haven't seen that. Um, in the U.S., the you know productivity went up mechanically in the COVID like everywhere else, and it has stayed higher. Um, you know there are certainly some things you can point to. Uh, you, know, you look at the stock market; the you know large tech companies are doing very well. They tend to be very scalable, very high productivity companies. Uh, that might be one reason why U.S. productivity growth has been higher than others. Um, but I, I think. At this point, it, it, it's hard to say just how persistent that rise in U.S. productivity growth will be. We have not built in a kind of a big productivity boom in the U.S. in our projection. Okay, we've got a couple more uh, questions here in the room. Um, next, I'm going to call on Paul Vieira of the Wall Street Journal, please. Was there any talk among officials about cutting rates today? Uh, Paul, we, look, we did discuss um, when to reduce our policy interest rate. Uh, there was a clear consensus to hold the policy rate at 5%. You know, as I've indicated, we were encouraged by the progress we've seen since January, and we agreed that what we wanted to see is we wanted to see this progress sustained. We wanted more time to be confident that this progress would be durable. We also agreed it would be appropriate to cut the policy interest rate when we're confident that we're clearly on a path to the 2% inflation target. Now, you know, as you might expect, we're a council of six different people, and so there's some diversity of there is some diversity of views about how close we are, and you know, 
you know, when we're going to see what we're looking for. Uh, I would just say, I think that's why you have a council. Uh, you want some diversity of views that's healthy uh, and, and we're having a good discussion. For the, for the decision today, there was a clear consensus to hold at 5%. Okay, and I'm going to go. And you now. will be getting the summary of deliberations in a couple of weeks with. Well, we will expand. Sorry about that, Governor. Uh, we'll uh, go now to uh, Randy the Dong Knight from uh, Bloomberg, please. Um, how worried are you about uh, relatively weaker loony restoking inflationary pressures? Uh, look, you know, we have a flexible exchange rate in Canada that allows us to gear monetary policy to what's going on in Canada. Uh, and overall, the Canadian dollar's been really reasonably stable. Um, you know, if, it, if the Canadian dollar does move, that's something we'll take into account uh, in terms of our outlook. It will affect, you know, a weaker Canadian dollar will tend to make our exports more competitive, will tend to have more strength in, in exports. Um, there will be some a direct pass through uh, through imported goods. Those are things we take into account. But look, the the flexible exchange rate uh, it, it 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 what it's what allows us to run a monetary policy in Canada geared to uh, what we need in Canada. And we will we will be you know we're gearing our monetary policy to where we think inflation's headed in Canada. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the reporters who have joined remotely now. I'll just remind you on the line to come off mute only to ask your question, and then please go back on mute as soon as you finish so that everybody can hear the response. I'm going to start with uh, John Ehrlichman from BNN Bloomberg and then go to Alicia Skirska from Yahoo and Max Sato of Mace News. So, John, uh, first question to you, please. Thanks so much. And Governor, uh, on commodity prices, uh, which we're watching very closely right now, can you just give us your current assessment on, on what you're going to be watching on the inflationary front from that perspective? Um, well, I guess a couple things on commodity prices. One, um, you, you have to look at commodity prices through two lenses. Uh, certainly, Global oil prices have a very direct impact on uh, things like gasoline prices, and, and that has a very direct and immediate impact on total CPI inflation. You know, gas prices you know, tend to go up and down, so that's one reason why we're particularly focused on core inflation. Um, and you know, we're you know, if you look at the near term, we, we know gasoline prices have gone up. That's why we think uh, total CPI inflation is likely to stay around 3% in, in, the, uh, in, in uh, months ahead. Um, what we're going to be particularly focused on is core inflation. We do think there will be further gradual easing in core inflation. And when we talk about uh, the progress we've seen recently being sustained, that's what we mean. Uh, or certainly that's an important element of, of what we're looking for. Um, the other element of commodity prices, of course, is Canada is an important commodity producer. We export a lot of commodities to the world. So the higher commodity prices, the more income tends to come into Canada. So it also affects demand. So we'll, you know, we're looking at, at both, both those dimensions. Okay, the next question is Alicia uh, Sikirska from uh, Yahoo Finance, please. Thanks, Governor, for taking our questions. Um, given that there will be a new federal budget uh, before the next rate decision, we've already seen some new spending measures announced. Can you talk about how the bank will be evaluating um, the potential effect of those measures at the next meeting? Uh, yes. Um, Look, the first thing I have to underline, I have to underline this every time I get a question on fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is appropriately the responsibility of elected governments, not the Bank of Canada. Uh, our elected politicians have a difficult job. They've got many choices to make. Um, but it's not our choice, it's not our job. Uh, 
Um, what we do is we take the spending plans of governments uh, as given. So when provincial or federal governments table a budget, we build, uh, we build those into our own forecast. So since January, as you've seen, there have been a number of provincial budgets. Uh, we have built their spending plans into the outlook we published today. Uh, obviously, the, the federal budget is, is a week from now, uh, so we have not We've not, you know, we don't have the budget. Uh, we we have not included changes in uh, the federal spending plans in this uh, outlook. Um, once the budget is tabled, uh, we will be producing. When we get to, I guess, July, we'll have a new forecast, and it will include um, the implications of the federal spending plans in that budget. Thank you for that. We're now going to go to Max Sato from Mace News, please. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, earlier, we saw reports from Asia that uh, semiconductor shortages have been largely resolved. But since global chip demand is recovering and we're seeing uh, slower deliveries of cars and trucks, for example, and shipping Turn companies are also diverting their routes to bypass some root, uh, areas. So. Do you think this can be a sign that the global supply chain is not fully recovering from the impact of the pandemic and geopolitical events and therefore adding upward pressures to uh, prices uh, in general? Well, if you, if you look in this section that describes the risks to our outlook, geopolitical tensions um, are one of those things. Um, and, and the types of things that we're looking at are, are the things that you mentioned. Um, certainly, um, if there's further disruption to, to shipping lanes or if, there's, uh, if some of the global tensions that we, that we see now escalate, that could have an impact uh, both on supply chains and on commodity prices. So um, it's, definitely, it's definitely one of the risks. It's listed alongside housing prices that we were just asked about a few minutes ago. Okay, our next group of online uh, questions will come uh, from Barbara Schechter of the Financial Post, followed by Anna Pereira of the Toronto Star, and then Rob McClister from Mortgage Log Jake News. Uh, Barbara, please, your question. Sorry, just coming off mute. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the diversity of views that you mentioned earlier in response to Paul's question, I think. I know you don't want to get ahead of your summary of deliberations, but uh, that was raised in the last one. So I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate um, a little bit on where that is. Is it on the, uh, in terms of the evidence needed for a cut? Uh, is it on particular data or breadth of data or would it be more on the risk side, the risk to your forecast? Uh, well, I think, look, I think Barbara, it's all of those things. Um, and I, I, I think, I guess you know, the way I would put it is, um, you know, all the members of the council are looking at all of those things. Um, you know, we've got different expertise, different experiences around that table. People, you know, that means people tend to weight different things slightly differently. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's hard to be much more precise. I don't know if you, if you, if you can, you, you were sitting at the yeah. table with me. What, anything I mean, to uh, add from your perspective? Yeah, there's... There's six of us. It would be really unusual if we all showed up with exactly the same view. We all we all look at the same data, but but as the governor said, um, you know our our background, our perspective um, leads us to sort of weight the data a bit differently. Sometimes interpret it a bit differently. Um, but that's a good thing. I mean, we, as the governor said, we, we have a council for a reason. Um, uh, the diversity of views is a, it's a feature, not a bug. And so, you know, it forces us to have a really robust conversation and I think get to the best possible decisions. So um, it's always been there. You get to see it more now because we give you a summary of deliberations. But, but a diversity of views is not a new feature on the governing council. Um, like I said, there's... There's a, there's a group of us, and we all come with just a slightly different view, so. Okay, Anna Pereira from the Toronto Star. If you have a question, please come off mute. Thanks so much for taking our questions today. Um, I want to know, how are you evaluating the impacts of the policy interest rate on shelter inflation and its effect on overall CPI? Um. <clears throat> 
So, well, first of all, I mean, sh shelter inflation is high. Uh, it's the biggest contributor to overall inflation, shelter inflation, 6.5%. Uh, and that really reflects two uh, big pieces. One is mortgage interest costs, which is directly related to the fact that we've raised our policy rates and that has uh, had the impact of raising mortgages. That's how monetary policy works. Uh, and then the second element uh, that is particularly elevated is rent. Rent is uh, in February increasing at a pace of 8%. Um, <clears throat> so how does that factor in? There are some other bits of shelter too, uh, insurance costs, uh, repair costs, things like that. Uh, how does that factor into uh, monetary policy? Well, I'd, I'd underline two things. First of all, uh, our target is for total CPI inflation. That includes shelter, and that reflects the fact that you know, look, shelter's a real cost of a cost for Canadians. Uh, it's a very important uh, element of their cost of living. Uh, so when you're when you're targeting two percent inflation, that's not something you can ignore. <clears throat> Having said that, um, we know that our policy actions uh, directly affect mortgage interest costs, and we know that. Uh, when it becomes appropriate to reduce the policy interest rate, those mortgage interest costs will start to come down. So we know, <clears throat> you know that is something uh, we can control for as we think about our monetary policy re uh, response. I've emphasized that we're particularly focused on core inflation. And one of the things our measures of core inflation have been doing is that if you look at the, the trimmed uh, mean measure of core, it has been systematically kicking out mortgage interest costs through this whole rate increasing cycle. It has not typically been kicking out other elements like rent or other elements of housing. And that's largely appropriate. I mean, you know, the increases we're seeing in rent suggests the real tightness we're seeing in the housing market. That's part of the economy. We have to factor that in. It's not the only part of the economy. We have to factor it in with all the other parts, but it's not something you want to ignore. Uh, it's not something you want to look through. Um, by focusing on core, we, we are effectively, though, looking through mortgage interest costs uh, while keeping, uh, including the other elements uh, of housing, which look, reflect there is a structural tightness in our housing market. Um, supply of housing has not been able to keep up with demand. Uh, that's, that's probably going to, we're probably going to be living that, we're gonna, probably going to be living with that for a while. Um, certainly there's a lot more focus now on getting supply up. You've seen governments at all levels are much more focused on this. Um, but, you know, it is going to take some time to work through that. Um, you know, that will continue to contribute uh, to inflation. Okay, Rob McClister, if you're there, please come off mute and ask your question. Good morning. Uh, Canadian inflation tends to be highly correlated with U.S. inflation. The latest uh, readings show uh, U.S. inflation running about 70 basis points higher than Canadian inflation and rising. So could such a divergence continue for a long time, and, and if U.S. inflation continues shooting higher relative to Canada, should Canadian borrowers expect that the bank would be materially less likely to cut rates this year? Um, well, look, the, the, the latest uh, U.S. CPI number just came out this morning. Uh, we haven't had a chance to look at it in any detail, so um, you know, I, I'm not going to comment uh, on you know today's data release out of the US. I think, you know, with respect to Canada, um, look, we're, we're focused on where we think inflation in Canada is headed. Uh, and I think I've been pretty clear, um, inflation's still too high. As, as Carolyn has underlined, there are a number of risks, risks remain. Uh, but we are encouraged by the evidence we've seen recently that uh, inflation uh, has moved down. There is some downward momentum going forward. We're looking for that to be sustained. Um, yes, developments in the United States have an impact on Canada, both the 
the strength of the U.S. economy, and we we import uh, particularly goods from the U.S. So you know that that will spill into Canada. If you look at the composition of U.S. inflation, goods price inflation is not the issue. It's more service price inflation, which is not something we tend to impact as much in, into Canada. So the, I don't see a big direct imported inflation effect. Um, but look, we'll have to look at this more closely. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize we we have our own monetary policy in Canada. We have our own uh, currency that allows us to have our own monetary policy. And we're really geared towards uh, what's happening, inflation in Canada. Uh, and that's really what's what we're focused on from a monetary policy perspective. Okay, just to wrap up, I believe Pete Evans of CBC had indicated he wanted to join the call and ask a question. Um, but I don't know if he's there. Pete, if you can... Um uh, come off mute by the time I finish this sentence, then you can have a question. Otherwise, that will uh, conclude today's press conference. Uh, thank you, Governor and Senior Deputy Governor, and all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much.